Wendy Henry is a managing director at Deloitte Consulting and currently serves as the global public services blockchain leader. She has deep experience working with clients to distill emerging technologies into simple business value discussions. A blockchain evangelist, as blockchain evangelist, she has worked with blockchain since around 2012 and is active in several blockchain consortiums. Wendy is a hands-on technologist with years of large-scale, complex system integration experience across a wide variety of technologies, including cloud, digital transformation, and of course, blockchain. She and her teams are currently delivering multiple blockchain projects for her clients, and she's going to talk a little bit about that and what real value looks like in the blockchain world. Please give it up for Wendy Henry. have gotten to listen to just a lot of really great presentations um, throughout the day and you guys have heard a lot of information. So I'll fast forward through some of this just because you've heard it. Um, and then what I'd like to do is, although Ashton made it sound a lot better than it probably is, um, I am doing a lot actively with multiple blockchain projects across multiple continents. Um, and I also do a lot with our college recruiting, uh, both in technology and not in technology. So one of the things I'd like to do is just leave a little bit of time at the end to see if you guys have questions in general. Okay, so businesses globally are really perking up and starting to invest in blockchain. <laughs> I'm going to show you a little bit later what the growth trajectory is, but we have seen um, a slow trickle of adoption. You heard that most people started to pay attention to it in about 2012 when the panel introduced themselves. It really came about in about 2008, late 2008, 2009, when Satoshi Nakamoto put out the white paper that I'm hoping every single one of you have read. And if you haven't, it really is a great piece. It's a short piece. Um, and while we're creating. But I'm not going to go into what is blockchain. You guys have seen that and heard that across multiple um, talks today. You've also heard a lot about why we're talking about it, what are some of the challenges and opportunities, because I know there's always challenges that we talk about, but I think we also need to focus on the opportunities when we talk a lot about it today. But I think one of the things that's interesting is some of the statistics here and how the market is actually starting to respond to this. In 2022, the estimate is that there will be $12 billion worth of blockchain spend locally. That's a lot of money, but it's yet not anywhere close to, if you look just a few years beyond that, the estimates are starting to get into the trillions. Now there's a wide variation in the numbers you will see here. Right? You can go and, and check things. And when I get asked by my leadership, you know, what is the market out there? How, why should we invest in this? I can't give them a definitive number. What I can tell them is that the numbers are escalating. Right? So there seems to be a continuous march upward in the estimates that we're beginning to see as more and more um, companies are starting to look to invest. Deloitte does an annual survey, it does it across uh, Fortune 500 globally, and it's a really good survey if you want to go look at it, it's got some really interesting insights in it. But what we are seeing even through that survey is a consistent uptick. The other interesting part is that the U.S., which you heard me say today that I think our government needs to sort of step it up a little bit in at least addressing regulatory and policy issues, but as a country, I would say we're close to being the leader. I, will, I won't say we're the leader. I think um, since these slides got made, and um, definitely if you take a look through, if you pull back the, the curtains and look behind them, China is spending an inordinate amount of money on blockchain and R&D. So I think we need to be careful about saying we're at the forefront just yet. I think there are some countries that have been doing a lot um, that we have not necessarily been privy to. I think Russia is also spending a lot of time and energy on R&D. You'll also see that with some companies, right? You didn't hear a lot out of Google about blockchain. 
and yet they have been significantly researching and doing R&D in the area. So just because you're not seeing it in the news, don't assume that it's not happening. The other interesting part, you heard a little bit about this today, is where we used to see industries, you saw FSI, right? F uh, financial systems and services industry was one of the first to jump on this bandwagon because payments and settlement were one of the natural uh, uh, value propositions for blockchain. However, what we're starting to see is we're starting to see holistic ecosystems starting to form. So when you think of um, when Procter & Gamble talked about the mayor's uh, trials that are going on, that started with shippers, right? So it started with shipping companies that had to move product um, across the ocean, if you will, on large ocean liners. And now we're seeing that insurance companies and underwriters and holistic ecosystems are getting involved in that. So that's another uh, maturation, if you will, in the understanding of blockchain and that, what it can enable. And this is just, I'm not going to go into this, um, but you can see that there's not really an industry uh, that's not looking at what is this technology and how can it drive change and optimization and new business processes and whole new business models, right? Nothing, if there's not, I mean, I think every single one of them is there. I don't know if you guys can come up with another one. But they're actively investing and actively building systems using this technology. Okay, so here's what I talked about. And it's kind of interesting, and my, my counterparts in RPA hate me for this graph because it shows that RPA is going to peter out here. And the reason for that is, is that, how many of you know what RPA is? Robotic process automation. Everybody know what that is? It really is um, what a smart contract is. So it's automation of manual tasks for the most part or, or repetitive tasks that can be automated. Use this technology very simplistically, and I'm sure I'm bastardizing that and I'm kind of for the paper, but, um, but smart contracts very much emulate what RPA does. You'll see that there was, if you think about that, that uh, Satoshi Nakamoto came out in 2008, right? And we're not even forecasting a significant uptick until 2023. That's a fairly long, flat runway. And when you talk about business and business having to invest, that's not something that your business leaders want to see. And so the question is, why is that? Right? Why is it taking so long for this technology that everybody is espousing to be transformative, and yet it, it's not taking off? And we talked a little bit about that today as well, this new business paradigm, which, remember, it's on the fringe. Right? It's, it's not something you're going to build for yourself. It's not an internal system. And so in an environment where companies have had to compete, they're now going to have to embrace those partners on the fringe as well as partners in and out of the value stream into some kind of cohesive mechanism to realize the benefit that blockchain is going to bring forward. And so that's that whole consortium, right? And until we get people who understand this and can come up with the business models and understand how to get, um, come forward with the value propositions for all of the ecosystem partners, we're seeing that as almost a brick, brick uh, wall. So we get uh, a lot of clients who will come in, they want to do blockchain, they want to be leaders in the space, they'll start building prototypes. And then once they get to that prototype, they'll even maybe get to a pilot. So a prototype is a very quick proof of what the system could be. When you move to a pilot, you actually have an operational system. But what you'll see with the building of blockchain pilots is we're emulating the players. So it'll be the company, right? So let's say we have a large oil and gas company and they want to do a, a 
order to cash implementation, right? They will emulate all of the partners in that order to cash flow. And so they'll pilot it to prove out how the thing will work, but they don't really have the players to the table. I will, cons I will tell you, I think it's done backwards. If you're going to go forward into a blockchain project, it would be better to get two or three of the players in the value stream that you're trying to emulate or trying to bring process re-engineering to, to the table to get going together. The second thing is the regulators, which we talked a lot about today as well. The regulators need to catch up. Tokenization is going to be large. You guys are going to be in a world that's very different than it is today. But the regulators have got to come out with what are the, um, what are the boundaries there. We talk a lot about the technology, and right now I'm going to kind of end up with the technology because I want to then focus elsewhere. Never have we globally had the community around the technology the way we do blockchain. Globally, there are more people trying to solve problems about around scalability and performance but they are still problems. This is a nascent and evolving technology. I personally believe that today we're talking about blockchain. The blockchain has some very core components. Right? It has the ledger. It has cryptography embedded in it. And it has a consensus mechanism. If you don't have those three things, you really don't have a blockchain. However, there are a lot of things I don't know how many of you have, has anybody heard of IOTA? Okay, a couple of you have. Right? Totally different. But it's a distributed ledger technology. Right? It just, it's foundational technology that brings that distributed ledger around. About doesn't necessarily have the distributed, the, the um, consensus mechanism. Right? So, Performance is definitely a big one, and it's one that you will see most of the focus on right now when people say it's not ready to go. And it is going fast, and we'll get there. Data privacy and security. It does have embedded encryption. It does have a tamper-resistant um, ledger. It is not inherently secure. You have still got to protect your nodes your machines that are running your blockchain like you would any other computer, right? So there's nothing magical about it. It is a tamper-evident distributed ledger that sits on a computing platform that must be secured. So you have to bear that in mind. You also have to bear in mind that what's on that ledger is viewable to all of the participants in the ecosystem. And we have the public networks, right, where everybody can see that. You guys can log on to the Bitcoin blockchain right now, or you can log on to the Ethereum mainnet. And you're going to see all of the transactions. Now, the data may appear to be gibberish, but you can see it. When you're in a permission blockchain, all of the participants in that permission blockchain can see it. Now, let's talk about that from a business perspective. Because businesses have a lot of IP. They don't today share out through their ecosystem. So you have to be very, very careful as you model these systems in what is actually going to go on what we call on-chain. We have off-chain co-located databases that you can store data in, and you can store data back in the source systems and just have pointers on the blockchain. So there's an entire data architecture to the data privacy that you've got to be aware of. Interoperability. Today we have Hyperledger. We have Ethereum. I'm sorry, I keep coming over here because that light is like right in your eyes if you're up here. But you have Hyperledger, you have Ethereum, you have um, digital assets, you have a handful of other proprietary blockchains. Uh, you've got R3 Cordo, which is incredible blockchain, right? What happens when I'm a business and I've got three or five or ten of these running? How many blockchains am I going to have and how are they going to talk to one another? 
So you've got to think about the interoperability and how that's going to work. And then finally to this with regulatory, the policy. So I, I said earlier when we were on the panel, this is this is a global technology. This is transnational, right? Across the board. So whose regulation do I have to abide by? Do I need to be concerned with, does everybody know what GDPR is? The data privacy that's coming out of the EU? Basically it says you have the right to be forgotten. You as an EU citizen, and I think this will happen in the United States here very shortly, you as an EU citizen have the right to be forgotten. How does that impact if you're on a immutable blockchain? Do I have to, if I'm here in the United States with a node, do I need to bear by that regulation? So these are all considerations that you have to think about and stuff that, that these are the kinds of things that are creating a little bit of hesitation as people are trying to work through what are the answers to these questions. And so that will take me to the final thing that I was kind of saying I'm, I'm kind of done with the technology discussion. And you also heard this today, but I cannot, I cannot impress you enough with the fact that the technology is the easy part here. I'm going to say it again. The technology is the easy part. We have a global community, which hopefully you all, some of you all will be members of. They're going to solve these problems. The business operating paradigms are the hard part. And I'm hoping another subset of you all are going to solve those problems. And the reason I'm telling you that is you don't have to be a computer science major, right? You do not. Does everybody know what design thinking is? Some of you? Well, what design thinking embraces, and I think there should be a blockchain thinking that goes right along with it, although we often use design thinking when we do our blockchain projects. But Design thinking basically says a problem is not insular to any one given piece of the problem, right? So it's nice if you have somebody that can draw the pretty pictures, it's nice if you have somebody that can code the system, it's nice if you can have somebody that can um, verify that the functionality is actually the way it should work, it's nice if you can have somebody that will go out and test the market, right? And draw up the nice marketing materials. But the fact of the matter is that the project as a whole doesn't succeed unless that team comes together. And wouldn't it be good if that team came together in the beginning, or at least in small pieces and parts as it moves along, as an integrated team to make this thing successful? And blockchain is very much the same way. It is a piece of technology that you need to pay attention to. The technology is definitely foundational, but it's not going to happen with a lot of other things happening around that technology. And those, this consortium we've talked about, which is at the core of it, it is an ecosystem. Remember, it's not a party of one or two, it's a party of five, ten million. You have to have some way. Who's going to, who owns the blockchain? Well, I love this when I ask it in the government audience, and especially when they get the answer. Who owns the blockchain? This is where you guys answer. Us. Everybody in the public. Who owns the blockchain in a permission blockchain? Businesses. The involved parties. It is. It's the it's it's the consortium. So how does that run? What are you gonna buy by? Where are you getting the talent? Who defines what the compliance is? What happens when you start to um, repurpose jobs? Those all have to be answered for you to implement a successful blockchain project. You cannot leave any of those out. And you have to convince the entire consortium that the answers that are come, you're coming up with are going to be of value to every single one of them in some way, shape, or form. So what I want you to take away from this is, number one, you don't have to be a technologist to live in this world. Number two, this is a mind-bending technology. 
and new business paradigm. There are a lot of really tough problems that need your brains and your creativity to solve. And so I want you to take away that no matter what you're doing, no matter what your major is, you can potentially impact the world you're going to live in because you will live in a distributed ledger technology world. It's just a matter of what you choose to do there. So thank you, and I'll take questions.